Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Tom Frieden, President and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. We're thrilled to be with you today to discuss the future of global health security and how governments and stakeholders can work together to better prepare for and respond to the next threat. COVID-19 is an ongoing threat for most of the world and we must address this risk and we must also broaden our attention to preparedness for the next threat. This is the world's now or never moment to invest in and strengthen public health systems around the world. Epidemics don't need to happen. Modest but sustained investments, improved health systems, better coordination and communication can enable the world to find, stop and prevent infectious disease outbreaks before they spread. The world was underprepared for COVID-19. We didn't stop the virus in time and we won't stop the next pandemic unless we take swift, strategic and sustained action. If we just do what we've always done, we'll get the results we've always gotten. That includes avoidable epidemics. But the power to alter the course of future outbreaks lies with us. And this is demonstrated by the eight case studies in our new report, Epidemics That Didn't Happen. This report is a tribute to the, great, to the great work that public health and healthcare staff on the front lines do fighting disease all around the world every day of the year. Consider the case study of anthrax in rural Kenya. A community-based surveillance system, a trained volunteer who took quick action and clear risk communication ended the outbreak in just a month after just four human cases or in Uganda, how activation of the emergency response system enabled them to find and stop Ebola before it spread. Because of effective surveillance and response, there was not an outbreak of uh, Ebola in Uganda. Another strong example is from Brazil, where because of careful planning and assessment and rapid action, there was a mass vaccination program against yellow fever that prevented an epidemic. All of these outbreaks and others described in this report, as well as thousands of others that may not ever come to anyone's attention are examples of what we can do when we get it right. What can be done uh, when the world is prepared? Because in fact, even when pandemics do happen, their impact can be reduced through strong preparedness and response measures. Millions of lives and trillions of dollars can be saved. The story of COVID-19 has unfortunately been largely one of failure, but there have been bright spots. For example, Vietnam was ready to respond based on weeks of preparation and years of work building effective outbreak response systems. Although they're dealing with an uptick in cases now, by May 2021, they had, had fewer than 4,000 total cases and just 35 deaths. Taken together, these studies illustrate that preparedness works. No response is perfect, and there's no one size fits all approach. But taken together, these studies demonstrate that in moments of crisis, communicating clearly and effectively while working collaboratively with partners and communities can prevent epidemics. To guide our conversation on the future of global health security, I'm delighted to, to share this virtual stage with our featured discussant, Don Arne Rotingen, Ambassador for Global Health in Norway. We hope the conversations today show what's possible when we invest in preparedness and early response systems. We have gaps to fill at the local, country, regional, and global levels. These case studies provide valuable data on lessons learned to help in decision-making to prevent future health emergencies. When responding to a disease outbreak, time is lives. How fast a system finds and responds effectively to a threat is the optimal measure of performance. To ensure the world is prepared, we must be able to respond as rapidly as possible to any new health threat. We've taken existing recommendations to propose a goal of 717, that every country should be able to identify any suspected outbreak within seven days of its emergence respond rapidly with investigation and reporting within one day and establish an effective response within seven days. 
Establishing this type of goal will provide impetus and accountability to make the substantial and sustained financial, technical, and political investments needed to improve global health and our capacity to find, stop, and prevent future pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the need to work together. We're all connected, and it's on all of us to prevent epidemics. As we work to continue our global COVID-19 response, we must also incorporate the lessons learned from epidemics that didn't happen and act now to prevent the next pandemic. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite my friend, Ambassador Jon Arne Rotengen, Ambassador for Global Health in Norway, to join me in this virtual conversation. Ambassador Rotengen, aside from his role as the Ambassador for Global Health, is Adjunct Professor at the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Prior to his role in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he was Chief Executive of the Research Council of Norway, and previously he served as the founding Interim Chief Executive Officer of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. Jon Arne, thank you so much for joining us. We've had so much going on. Of course, with the COVID pandemic, we're all focused on the here and now, but also on making the world safer going forward. Recently, we had the IPPR report come out as the first really big report. What do you think are the main takeaways from that report? And most importantly, what can we do to make sure that these and other key recommendations actually are acted on? Well, one, I think the report is good and they have managed to communicate some high level recommendations in a clear and strong way. Um, we need a strong WHO, uh, but we need a more independent WHO that uh, could operate independently and actually make decisions faster uh, and also interact with countries maybe a bit more sort of uh, with more authority without sort of threatening uh, sovereignty of, of countries. Uh, it's a tricky balance, but it's important. And then I think what they clearly are demonstrating is that we need stronger capacities. Um, this is a weakest link problem. Uh, we need strong capacities in all countries. Uh, and to achieve that, we need technical and financial support uh, and collaboration, um, collaboration between public health professionals across countries. Um, we're going to see the G20 over the coming uh, days, weeks, and months be very important to global preparedness and response. What can the G20 do to promote sustained, sustainable, predictable, sufficient funding for preparedness around the world? Yeah, the G20 countries um, is a good group of countries. One, they are, of course, the among the largest economies of the world. Um, in total, uh, they would contribute actually around 85% of what is, would be needed if we sort of share uh, the burden of financing this collectively together. So that speaks to the economic power and the importance of, of the G20. Uh, but I think it's also important to understand that the G20 is um, is a mixed group of countries. It's, it's both um, the sort of established high income countries, the G7 group, but it's a broader group. It's the emerging economies uh, and it's uh, good representation across all regions. And I think that's uh, key and important uh, when actually going from recommendations to decisions and action. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, and I think it's important that the G20 demonstrates leadership. Having said that, I think we also need to be a bit sort of pragmatic in the sense that G20 rarely actually initiates by G20 as such uh, new initiatives and new institutions or new mechanisms um, they are more an opportunity to agree, I think, collectively. And then there needs probably be other mechanisms to make sure that we can deliver on it. That could be through the World Health Organization, through the UN, or through coalition of countries that come together. This brings the issue of how do we make change? How do we get from this unacceptable condition we're in now with the world not really prepared to much better prepared, understanding that when the headlines fade, there will be a real reluctance to continue to invest. I know in Norway, you have kind of a, a societal commitment to assisting and to global engagement. How can all levels of society from community members to local officials to decision makers 
try to improve our epidemic preparedness. Yeah, no, Tom, I, uh, both you and I, we, we have been sort of public health professionals, and I guess we are still, um, but in different roles, and, and we've been leaders in national public health institutes or, or centers for disease control. Um, to be honest, uh, I often in that role, I, I felt the lack of sort of a patient organization or a civil society organization that really called for public health measures and, and for prevention and preparedness measures, because we want to mobilize for what should not happen. In a way, we want to, um, and, and success is really measured of the lack of what things are happening. Uh, and, and your report now really demonstrates that. It's, it's really when, when we are able to control outbreaks at an early stage that we are successful. And, and that is maybe most times way before any of the public actually know about it. Um, a, a national institute uh, examines and uh, investigates outbreaks uh, every week. Um, and most of it is never reported in media. So how can we then mobilize a societal understanding? Um, I think, of course, a pandemic is a key moment to actually do that. And I think everyone now sees the importance of having sustained, predictable uh, technical capacities, investments in these areas. Um, I must say, even in Norway, um, we have reduced investments in the public health functions at the na national level for, for some years. Um, of course, all, all national governments would need to prioritize in budgets and, and need to make sure that we are um, spending on the most important issues. And, and when nothing is happening, it's a tendency for politicians to say, okay, maybe we can cut a bit, a bit here and, and actually expand on other areas. Um, I think what we have seen is that we need really to invest, but this is at the national level. What we really need to do is of course, also collectively to invest um, and, and do that together. Many will then sort of see this as important investments in development aid, but, but I think it's really important to try to frame this differently than development aid. Because to, at least from my perspective, development aid is for um, sort of investments that countries ideally would like to make themselves their key priorities um, that they, when they have very limited resources that we need to do first. And, and I, I think in many of the lowest income countries, we have big um, disease uh, situations, big health systems needs that needs to be addressed tomorrow. And, and it's hard for them to make uh, the very um, tough decisions on actually uh, investing in prevention and preparedness um, for functions that may not sort of be very visible. Uh, so that's why I think we also need to see this as a, not only a public good in at the national level, but also a global public good when, when it comes to uh, collective investments across countries. So you raised the really important issue of advocacy advocacy from the public, from the equivalent of patient groups for spending on public health. Um, how do you think we can fairly finance global health security? You've made clear you think that development assistance is limited. What are some other options? How would you succinctly summarize what we may need to do going forward? No, as I said, uh, in countries, we would definitely see this as a public function. Uh, it's a public good. Uh, it's a good for everyone uh, when it's here. Uh, we can avoid uh, infectious disease threats uh, and it's a collective investment. And we normally um, fund that through taxation and, and to collective needs. Um, when we then look at this from a global perspective, I actually think we also need to use the same concept. We need fair contributions from everyone, not the individuals and the companies within individual countries, but we need fair contributions from all countries. So from the, the highest income country to the lowest income country, all needs to invest. And they would need to invest both domestically, but also contribute to some level of collective finance. Um, and of course the economic uh, capacities of countries, they are different and, and that would need to be reflected. So a clear burden share model uh, where all countries contribute, but depending on their capacities, I think that would be important moving forward. And what do you think we can do better about something like the vaccine equity problem? Norway has been one of the very, very few countries to say we're going to share our doses even though we don't have enough for ourselves. But globally, we see a situation of vaccine nationalism, which is 
ethically inexcusable, but in many countries, politically inevitable. Are there some ways we could get around this in the future? Yeah, so one, I think in the current pandemic, we really need to address this problem head on, because if we do not address this, we will not all have a sort of a collective um, understanding that all countries are actually collaborating and we will not have an agreement on a preparedness and response system for the future. So we need to demonstrate actually that we can deliver equitable access in this pandemic. If not, we will not be trusted in the future. And then for the future, uh, I think actually the we, we need to follow the financial resources. We need to have some capacities that early on in a pandemic, in a crisis, can invest on behalf of those countries with lower purchasing power. Um, of course, this time around, it was really important that the USA, the United Kingdom, Europe invested early in risk-based investments to start scaling up um, production of vaccines, but also to finish the development process. But actually, we need have, would have needed someone alongside them that could invest on behalf of uh, the lowest income countries. We had that in mind and we developed the COVAX facility, but we didn't fund the COVAX facility until half a year later. And of course, then they come late to the sort of negotiation table when it comes to making contracts. Um, so I think that needs to be agreed in advance. It's definitely a preparedness measure. So what I've heard so far is we need burden sharing, su substantial resources for preparedness, and in advance, arrangements to order sufficient supplies for every country in the world. Now we're getting some some questions come in from the audience. Actually, the first three are quite similar. Let me summarize them here. People understand or can recognize the value of investing in preparedness, but it frequently has low electoral or political reward compared with other investments, whether in disaster relief or other things how can governments be better incentivized to invest in prevention? Yeah, I think it, in, in two ways. One is that they need to bind themselves to the mast in the, say, in the way now when we have the understanding of the current pandemic, uh, governments need to come together and actually make firm commitments to collectively finance these functions. Uh, and it's better to do it now when they have uh, sort of a, a fresh memory of what is happening. The G20 countries have spent 12 trillion US dollars in economic stimulus just to compensate for the, the financial and economic impact of the of the crisis. Um, and, and if we can just have a very small proportion of that, uh, we, we would have come a very far way of, of making the necessary preparedness investments. Uh, so one is to, to, to make commitments and actually sign on to them uh, collectively. Uh, the second is that um, countries would need to understand that this is a risk uh, on, on their balance sheet, on their economic system, um, and, and they should be assessed based on that. Um, so credit ratings, uh, the opportunity of the IMF to assess countries' um, risk levels in many ways, um, should also incorporate fully their capacities to handle uh, infectious disease uh, risks and, and threats. Next question. Uh, there have been some governments and some leaders uh, that have been less than transparent and sometimes have politicized the COVID pandemic. What do you think that NGOs and civil society can do to help stem the politicization of response measures in the preparedness phase? And how can that be funded? Should that also be part of preparedness? Well, that's a very good question. Um, Actually, when, when the pandemic started, I was in a different role. I was heading the, the national research uh, and innovation funding uh, organization in Norway. So in a way, a combination of NIH and NSF in the US. Um, and what was very positive, I must say, uh, in this first half year of the pandemic was that the interest of the public in science and knowledge and, and understanding evidence was really increasing. We could measure it on, on our regular polls that they became more interested uh, so actually, uh, the, the role of science and evidence and information in society in Norway, that actually was strengthened as a part uh, of, of, a, of the pandemic response of society. That's not the case in all countries. And I think to actually make that um, happen, I think you need a sound base of, of that um, understanding already established and you need trust in society. 
Um, so investments in sort of science literacy, literacy and and actually um, a, a system of evidence informed policy making is crucial. And I think actually then systems for making governments and the politicians accountable for their decisions uh, and comparing that to whether they have used a sound science base will be quite important. Uh, and to do that, I think the, the best way of accountability is actually a strong civil society that actually can call out both agencies and, and, and formal operational bodies in government as well as politicians. Um, so, so it's a good good idea to, to make that a part of, of preparedness. Great, thank you. Uh, analogously, what do you think the role of the private sector is in preparedness and response? Oh, I, I think we've definitely seen the role of private sector um, when it comes to the technologies, uh, when it comes to vaccines, uh, therapeutics, uh, diagnostics. Um, we, we need public-private partnerships, but we need partnerships because uh, we also see clearly that um, the private sector will not be able to deliver this based on sort of normal uh, yeah, market forces and more normal mechanisms. We need we need uh, a system where we can agree on priorities and, and incentivize or subsidize or, or create some level of uh, pull incentives for companies to get involved. Um, and then I think also definitely on the logistics side and on the delivery side, there is also a, a role of private sector uh, being a part of a strong preparedness system, definitely. We have three last questions from the audience. First, are joint external evaluations still relevant? I have strong views on this, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, I know that you have you've done research on this, so uh, so I in a way should <laughs> turn that to the evidence base. Um, I think it's it, it's actually interesting to see that uh, many of the indicators we have and and the evaluations that we have um, trying to is estimate whether countries have sound capabilities and and capacities for preparedness, they're not perfect in in actually predicting how how countries are. Uh, have been faring in a way in, in, in the pandemic. So to me, I think it's they, they are very important and we still need them and we need to in, improve them, but we they will never substitute sort of um, a much broader um, set of uh, yeah, capacities in countries, uh, trust uh, a political system that not only have the technical capabilities, but also the political ability and, and the political will to act when necessary. And I think we, we saw quite big variations in that across countries. Um, so we would certainly agree. We, it's clear that you need not only the public health capacities, but also the government and the governance to work yeah. effectively. And one of the things that we've suggested is the 717 target so that you can have a real assessment of whether countries are finding and stopping threats on a regular basis quickly. Uh, last two questions. First, um, global funding has mostly been for uh, infectious diseases. As we saw during COVID, population health plays a vital role in emergencies. How can we motivate countries and donors to invest in uh, cancer, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, the non-communicable diseases where immediate benefits may not be so relevant or so visible, I should say. They're relevant, but not visible. Yeah. And, um, and I think we, uh, back to my comment of sort of, uh, domestic or national decision makers making their priorities versus sort of the global community making the priorities. I think I think this needs to be driven by by one disease burden and the needs of countries and, and of course the effectiveness of different interventions. Um, I think we have a lot to achieve through implementing big public health interventions uh, for non-communicable diseases. Um, the challenge is that we, we do not have money to sort of um, disinvest uh, in important uh, infectious disease programs. HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, uh, neglected tropical diseases are still big issues. And of course, also maternal and, and child health. So the challenge is how to mobilize actually more resources at, at the same externally, at the same time, we, we, we help countries gradually developing so sound health financing systems domestically. Um, that's not a quick fix, um, but that's why I partly argue for actually these epidemic preparedness functions to be global collective goods and 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 different in a way from uh, official development assistance for health development in countries. 
to avoid crowding out what is also very important um, interventions. So you're making the important point that we don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul. We don't want to rob any one global health program to start another one. I would add that for some of the programs like tobacco, obesity, um, hypertension, the needs at the national level are for capital, but more for political capital than financial capital to raise taxes on tobacco, alcohol, sugar, sweetened beverages to uh, mandate really effective front of pack warnings on unhealthy food, things like this. So yes, there's definitely need for resources, but also for political capital and uh, things like taxation of unhealthy products can yield uh, revenues that can be used for other programs. Last question, what do you think the three most important things we've learned in the past year are about how we can better prepare for the next big health threat or pandemic? Uh, one is that uh, things can happen and move very quickly. Uh, so um, I think we, we need to address the speed, we, the speed of the response, the speed of, of, of how we uh, react. Um, then, and uh, I think we, we need to, to actually clearly understand that uh, political um, decisions matters. Uh, and, and if we have leaders that are willing to institute sort of the necessary measures, we may gain a lot um, uh, early and that we can, of course, um, maintain the sort of response, response and trust in society. But then I think we also see very clearly that um, we, we, when we really attack hard early in a pandemic, we need to sustain that response. Uh, and that needs continuous sort of yeah, negotiation in many ways with the public and the popular support. It's very tough. And, and to be honest, this time around, we have been very lucky when it comes to the speed of development of, of vaccines and actually we can get out of the pandemic or, or epidemic situation in countries gradually through vaccination. That may not be the case the next time around. And, and we actually need to, to be able to sustain even longer uh, with, through the traditional public health measures. So the best thing is definitely to, to work early and to respond early to, to avoid it all, <laughs> to avoid an outbreak becoming an epidemic and becoming a pandemic. We need so Act early, uh, make sure you have political consonants and effective political action and keep it up because infectious disease and other health threats are going to be with us indefinitely. And so we need to persist in preparedness. Gunnarne, thank you so much for uh, discussing these issues with me and with our uh, workshop this morning. Thank you for the work that you do and we look forward to continuing to learn from you and make progress together to make the world a safer and more prepared place. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Jon Arne. Next, I'd like to introduce Betsy McKay, a senior writer for the Wall Street Journal, who will speak with Dr. Sylviane Adigieri on lessons learned from the yellow fever outbreak in Brazil. But first, a short video on epidemics that didn't happen. The head of Guinea's health agency has announced that Guinea is in the midst of an Ebola epidemic situation. Saw the galloping rise of SAR, severe acute respiratory syndrome. The Zika virus and its potentially devastating consequences continues to spread. The past 20 years have been burdened by a series of international health emergencies, resulting in lives lost and disrupted economies. Now, a short time ago, the World Health Organization declared the outbreak an international public health emergency. Emergency. Never has this been more apparent than during the COVID-19 pandemic, which soberly demonstrated that our health and livelihood is dependent on others anywhere in the world. COVID provides us with the most teachable moment of our lifetimes. If we don't fix it now, we're not going to fix it. What news outlets don't capture are the thousands of epidemics that didn't happen. It's that constant everyday work that really makes the difference. Finding those initial cases and being able to respond to one or two cases stops them from becoming hundreds of cases and then thousands of cases. Now, in a first of its kind report, Resolve to Save Lives spotlights the stories of epidemics that didn't happen, highlighting outbreaks that were stopped in their tracks by strong public health systems, excellent communications and political support. Our our report, Epidemics That Didn't Happen, shows that epidemics don't have to happen. That if we work together, if we commit to finding, stopping, and preventing health threats, 
we can make the world a much safer and much healthier place. In Kenya, the risk of an anthrax outbreak was controlled in just over a month because of quick action and trust from members of the community. Community-based surveillance is where we survey our village to raise the community, uh, the voice of our community members, in that they'll be giving us information in case of emergence of any, any sign of a disease or in case of any appearance of any disease. The Kenya action was really successful because it used networks of community volunteers like the Red Cross to engage in things that are important to communities where they are. So the, the thing that it really highlights is that uh, pandemic prevention, epidemic preparedness starts all the way at the individual level in the community and needs to go all the way up into the highest levels of the government. In Brazil, a massive yellow fever outbreak was prevented by an ambitious vaccination plan and advance action. In December 2016, it became clear to the epidemiologists monitoring the yellow fever episodics in a specific area of Brazil, in southeast Brazil, that an epidemic was imminent. There were three major aspects of the success of the yellow fever response in Brazil. First, the capacity of the country to increase dramatically its vaccine production and to deploy the vaccines to the population and municipalities at risk. Second, to expand in a couple of months the laboratory network countrywide, all states able to do PCR and to use the surveillance of episodics and the modeling and the geographic information system to anticipate cases in humans approximately one month in advance. It means vaccinating in advance the population at risk. These epidemics that didn't happen show us how the trajectory of an epidemic can be fundamentally altered when a country invests in and prioritizes preparedness for infectious disease outbreaks and readiness to act when it strikes. Preparedness is only part of the story. We need to act and we need to act collectively. Collective action is critical. As the COVID pandemic highlighted, how interconnected the world can be. I hope that um, in rediscovering our shared humanity, it will give us the passion to work very hard and realize that you know, our interventions need to come in not only at the global level, but all the way to the country level, to the state level, and to communities. With this pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to invest in public health, to prevent the next pandemic, and to ensure that as a world, we are never, ever again caught so underprepared. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Uh, and I'm here with Dr. Sylvain Aldighieri. We're going to talk about how investing time and resources in preparedness can help prevent the next pandemic. Um, so Dr. Aldighieri is Deputy Director for Health Emergencies of the Pan American Health Organization. He specializes in epidemiology and tropical microbiology. Uh, and he is going to talk about how mass vaccination and strong risk assessment helped um, stop yellow fever in Brazil. And we'll talk about um, preparedness, uh, pandemic preparedness more generally. So um, thank you for being here, Dr. Altigari. Thank you, Ms. McCain. <laughs> So I, I wondered if you could, you know, reflect, we can reflect on this um, yellow fever outbreak. And what is the single most crucial step that, um, that was taken to, to prevent or um, in this case, um, stop it? I would say the existence of a strong uh, expanded program of immunization dealing with uh, many vaccines, including uh, measles, but also including uh, yellow fever uh, in children one year uh, of age. Uh, so this is really the platform on which uh, preparedness and response uh, can be ensured for responding to yellow fever uh, in Brazil, but only in Brazil. Also, we have uh, 13 countries in the Americas that are endemic uh, for sylvatic yellow fever with uh, always a risk of uh, spread and uh, outbreaks. Was this, you know, how do you, was this a surprise when, when this particular um, yellow fever outbreak occurred? I mean, it, 
you know, it seems around the world that all of a sudden, three or four years ago, there were a lot of yellow fever outbreaks. And um, uh, I just wonder how, you know, how much local authorities were taken by surprise and, and how prepared they actually were for this. To have a yellow fever outbreak in one of the 13 countries endemic uh, for yellow fever with a sylvatic cycle, so the, the virus is circulating among the non-human human primates population, is not a surprise, but the magnitude of this outbreak, uh, the speed of spread of this outbreak, mm -hmm. and uh, locations uh, where a little bit surprising because some of the affected areas did not report yellow fever uh, during 60 or 70 years previous to this outbreak. So I would say this was part of a surprise. But again, back to your first point, uh, with a strong uh, immunization program established in uh, at all levels of the country, from the federal level to the state level to the municipal level in Brazil, as um, 5,600 plus different municipalities. So this was really the base for responding to this outbreak. So what was the biggest uh, challenge, would you say, in, in dealing with it, in dealing with this outbreak? Um, the logistics, the availability of vaccine uh, at global level, uh, this outbreak uh, emerged after um, challenging outbreaks in Central Africa, in Angola, follow, followed by DRC and Congo. And the demand in terms of vaccines uh, was important. And uh, Brazil uh, uh, made a very important donation at this moment uh, to uh, the African continent. So uh, we were short in terms of uh, vaccines, and even Brazil is uh, was the is and was the first producer of yellow vaccine, yellow fever vaccine uh, at global level. Again, logistics was the big challenge. It was actually delivering. Uh, so supply was a was a problem. Was actually delivering and administration um an issue or is that pretty well worked out given the strong immunization program? all the aspects of what you describe were challenging and there were uh, <laughs> fixed uh, step by step but even the global supply of vaccine uh, you know a supplier uh, in the private sector uh, one big supplier supplier uh, one supplier in, in africa and one supplier in russia and one supplier in uh, Brazil. So this was the landscape in terms of vaccine supply at this moment. But once, uh, when uh, vaccines were available in the country, Brazil is a re really big, big country. And some affected areas and some communities were really hard to reach communities uh, in the uh, Atlantic rainforest, for example. Okay. And could it have been stopped earlier? I mean, it did it did build to some size before it stopped, which I guess is is you know not surprising. It, in looking back on it, were there any were there any steps that could have been taken earlier or lessons learned um, that might be applied to the next one? Uh, I, I would choose to answer regarding the lesson learned. You know, uh, yellow fever in these thirteen countries of uh, Latin America. Uh, is endemic. The virus is circulating in the primary rainforest and in some secondary rainforest areas. So virus is, uh, is there. So I would say that the key aspect was to work on the human-animal interface aspect. Not exactly epidemics, but episodics. And the modeling of these episodics, taking into account different layers of uh, land occupation, uh, type of forest, type of non-human primates, uh, climate, uh, rain, uh, mosquito vectors, was very important because the modeling of the cycle, the sylvatic cycle, provided us with key information one month in advance regarding the spread, the path 
of uh, the spread of the epizootic and gave time one month in advance to vaccinate the people living on the, the path of this uh, episode. That's really interesting. There's probably lessons in that given, given the importance um, of the animal human interface, right? I mean, we, we see this over and over again and um, see it with COVID-19. Uh, absolutely. And uh, the laboratory network uh, in this case is very important because you have to deal with uh, human uh, suspect cases, but also you have to deal with signals among non-human primates, monkeys, and different species of monkeys. And these signals have, must be also characterized using very specific technique. And uh, uh, so I, um, back to my uh, first uh, sentence, uh, the laboratory network and how to combine human and animal health among a coordinated laboratory network uh, is the key of uh, the preparedness and the response. And also, again, lessons learned in one country, Brazil, which is a very large and big country in terms of uh, population. Uh, also, these lessons learned apply to uh, the rest of, of the continent with the same yellow fever uh, sympathetic risk. Okay. And have those lessons been applied to, to other countries? Maybe we should talk Absolutely. About it's what we have done. We have uh, using uh, the um, Brazilian uh, savoir-faire, uh, the experience of a Brazilian scientist. Uh, we train many countries in the Amazon basin, in Suriname, in Guyana, in Bolivia, in Paraguay, in Peru, and others. So really, it was uh, very important for us really to source the knowledge uh, uh, at, the, at this moment. And we are still doing it because it's a permanent uh, preparedness uh, cycle. You, Again, the virus is there. It's circulating. And some, sometimes, uh, with different factors, there is a high risk of amplification and very rapid spread. So it's a question of knowing or being able to predict when it's going to Absolutely. jump into the population and then being ready. Absolutely. Uh, be very uh, um, strict in analyzing, detecting these signals in the population because, of course, uh, yellow fever um, has a very specific case definition, but mild cases can um, can happen and the system would detect it with some delay. So it's really combining the event-based surveillance, detecting signals, characterizing signals, the indicator-based surveillance, the established surveillance system, and the laboratory network. And uh, But also uh, be aware of um, the ge different generations and some of the young doctors, young nurses were not exposed to these large outbreaks of yellow fever as their fathers or grandfathers or grandmothers. And uh, we have to train permanently uh, the healthcare workers on detecting these uh, suspect uh, cases and these signals. Right. This is, it, you know, because we were talking about a, a large immunization program, I also wanted to ask, um, something that we see or talk about a fair amount in the current situation with COVID, um, vaccine hesitancy. So do you know, did you, you know, with this immunization effort in Brazil and beyond for yellow fever, did you encounter much vaccine hesitancy or other? It's amongst, yes, vaccine hesitancy is uh, unfortunately part of the, the challenges that we face in this kind of situation in peacetime, pre-outbreak, as uh, during uh, wartime, I mean, during the response to the outbreak. But in the case of yellow fever in Brazil, the population most at risk are uh, young adult male that go into the forest for their work, legal or illegal work, and uh, gold diggers, um, etc. And this population is quite complex to confines 
for getting the vaccine. You know, there is uh, there another way. There are uh, tough people uh, going into the forest. So combines them regarding taking a vaccine where every day their life is uh, at risk is also challenging. So special uh, communication materials were uh, developed for dealing with this population. On the other side, it's much easier in terms of long-term investment to convince mothers for having their children at one year of age to be immunized against uh, yellow fever. This is part of a routine immunization program. So really different populations with different um, messaging for convincing them. Right. Um, yellow fever is also interesting because in the in the discussions about um, vaccine passports, you know, will will vaccination be a requirement for traveling around the world? Immediately makes me think of the yellow yellow fever vaccination cards that are required to travel to so many places. <laughs> Uh, oh. Of course, of course. At this moment, under the international health regulations, uh, yellow fever vaccine is that is the only uh, vaccine that uh, you, you would have the option to ask for for uh, uh, leaving a country and entering another country. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really uh, one of the best examples how the international health regulations should work. And there are, of course, uh, in COVID time, many discussions regarding this. Uh, but so far, as of today, uh, the yellow fever vaccine is the only vaccine with, that we have under the regulations. Do you think it will be a model at all for for, vac for uh, requirements for COVID-19, or is it too early to, to really know? It may be, may be too early, but this is the perfect experience we can use to balance the pro and the cons. Yeah. Well, you know, um, and more broadly, let's talk about the lessons learned and the experience, how you can apply the experience to, to COVID-19. So, you know, what lessons are there from this successful response, basically this stopping an outbreak that um, could be applied or are being applied um, in Latin America for the COVID-19 response? As, as I mentioned, uh, Brazil being a big country and a large country has a very interesting system uh, in terms of integrated health system. And primary health care is run by the municipalities, more than 5,600 municipalities. I'm very sorry if I the numbers are not exact, exact, uh, but I would say that the, uh, the best lesson learned from this yellow fever outbreak, from the outbreak, from the COVID uh, pandemic now, is the responsiveness, preparedness and responsiveness of primary healthcare levels. This is the key lesson. Everything uh, can be uh, mitigated if you have a very strong, probably uh, primary healthcare system. It avoids a lot of trouble in following during the following steps of the, of the response. Again, integrated and strong primary healthcare, including preparedness including the tools that we have, multi-hazard preparedness, and also specific components for uh, disease-specific responses. So to prepare for the next pandemic, this is obviously a very you know, strengthening primary health care, um, as you say, is a very important lesson. Um, what are the other important steps to take to, to prepare for the next pandemic? Either learn from this response or or more broadly? A combination of, uh, of course, I would not cover all the aspects uh, for the COVID response. We have uh, 10 uh, response pillars. Mm -hmm. But I'd like, to, again, to highlight uh, the aspect of logistics, including the logistics uh, for vaccine. And I'd like to uh, highlight the aspect 
of the uh, laboratory networks and specifically regarding uh, the genomic surveillance uh, networks. You know, really uh, having a close look uh, and have all capacities existing uh, for dealing with uh, the genetics of the virus. We are talking a lot for COVID-19 regarding genomic surveillance with the variants, variants of concerns, variants of interest. But in the Americas, uh, during the last 10 years, there was already a movement and uh, networking and reference centers uh, for doing uh, the genomic surveillance of the yellow fever virus. It's, it's, very, uh, it's at the center of our response. And it allows you combining with what I described in terms of human animal interface to have a better knowledge of uh, how the spread uh, is going to be and how um, the uh, what are the uh, um, what are the predictions of the spread of the virus. It can it gives you uh, intelligence uh, regarding the tracking of the outbreak. What do you see as the most critical or the uh, issues in terms of preparedness that the um, G7 and the G20 should discuss? I would say uh, trying to focus on healthcare workers. We have this population of healthcare workers now dealing with a day by day battle for more than 16 months. Think investment in healthcare workers. Think investment in uh, protecting healthcare workers, personal protective equipment, vaccinations for health workers, but also training and number of healthcare workers, including the specialties that we need at this moment. We think a lot about uh, equipment, uh, ventilators, for example, but to run ICUs, we need highly trained nurses and we need to have enough nurses to rotate in order to cope with the shock, the impact and the day-to-day -day work. This is the point that I would like to stress. Right, it's very important. Uh, so will we prevent the next pandemic? We would develop all the tools and update the tools that we have in order to be uh, better prepared and using, uh, uh, we have to do many lessons learned exercise uh, after the yellow fever outbreak, but also uh, after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Aldiguerre, for sharing that important experience with us and um, and what we need to do going forward. Thank you, Ms. McCain. And thank you so much, Betty. Uh, my name is Amanda McClones. I'm the Senior Vice President at Resolve to Save Lives. And joining me today is a fantastic panel, including Dr. Jane, the Minister of Health from Uganda, Abby Byrne, uh, the Community-Based Surveillance uh, Technical Advisor for the International Federation of the Red Cross, and Ricardo Eschelar, the Emerging Threats Advisor for USAID based out of Nairobi. Uh, the panel today is really going to focus on two additional case studies building off what we've just heard uh, from the PAHO example in Brazil, uh, and really looking at the interface and the interaction between communities, governments and civil society to really address uh, gaps in pandemic preparedness and epidemic preparedness and how we can stop outbreaks at that community level. Uh, so I'm going to start with Dr. Jane and uh, ask her to, to walk us through the lessons learned of the Ebola outbreak that, that raged in DRC for several months and the challenges that posed for Uganda to be prepared for that threat and, and what worked and what lessons could you take away from that for additional uh, preparedness. Thank you very much, Amanda, and I do hope that I can be heard clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, as we are all aware today, the world is grappling with the response to the coronavirus disease. The disease has devastated almost every country. 
and we have lost millions of people and uh, another several million cases have been recorded worldwide. Nearly over 164 million cases and more than 3 million deaths. As of 20th May 2021, Uganda has registered 43,223 cases and 350 deaths, higher than the highest experienced cases of Ebola virus disease outbreaks in Uganda. The resilience with which Uganda has responded to COVID-19 has been built over time since the country signed the International Health Regulations 2005. By being part of the global health security agenda since 2014, the country has continued to build capacities that reduce the spread of disease epidemics across borders. Using real-time surveillance, reporting, laboratory services, risk communication, and community engagement to offer a quick turnaround time and preparedness capacities. Uganda has been able to successfully respond in a timely manner to the emerging and re-emerging health outbreaks. I'll now quickly look at the Ebola virus disease outbreak in Uganda 2019 and how Uganda detected cases of Ebola at the border. In October 2018, the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country neighboring Uganda in the east, experienced a large Ebola virus disease outbreak. By the time the outbreak in the DRC was over in June 2020, 3,481 people had been infected and 2,299 had succumbed to Ebola. That is 66% case fertility rate, making it the second largest outbreak of Ebola to date. Uganda was at high risk of cross-border transmission and started preparedness activities in 10 districts along the Democratic Republic of Congo border. And the activities included timely risk assessment, zoning the districts according to risk and resource planning, strengthening emergency response operations at national and district level, improving the national laboratory system, including field deployment of rapid testing systems, timely disease surveillance actively with border screening and community level surveillance, strengthening public health legislation enforcement, and financing for preparedness activities, training and deploying frontline responders, over 5,000 vaccinated people because we now, as you are aware, we have the Ebola vaccine. So over 5,000 were vaccinated by November 2018. And we intensified risk communication and community engagement at national and district levels, including training our village health teams to carry out community surveillance. In June 2019, Uganda responded to the sixth Ebola outbreak where three cases were detected at the border with Democratic Republic of Congo while entering the country. Having prepared for the Ebola outbreak since August 2018, we rapidly mobilized, deployed the response teams and resources to the affected districts. Up to 108 contacts were listed and followed up for 21 days none of them turned positive. The preparedness activities were further reinforced during the outbreak response and no cases were detected beyond these three. After 42 days, the outbreak was declared over. I want to emphasize the importance of partnerships, which was well evidenced as Uganda responded to the Ebola outbreak. Strong partnerships for support, both financially and also technically, and stakeholder engagements are critical in responding to any public health emergency. 
Going forward, before the declaration of the outbreak of COVID-19 in China on the 31st of December 2019, Uganda was responding to an Ebola threat from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And as I mentioned before, it had been going on for two years. With health workers staying at the border for two years and also at the airports and every point of entry. Therefore, when COVID-19 broke out, we were relatively prepared and we only redirected, broadened and intensified surveillance and all pillars of response to control the COVID-19 pandemic. As the pandemic ravaged the world, we began our response by categorizing countries of incoming travelers based on risk in their countries and we categorize this as, as high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. So countries categorized as high risk or moderate risk, we are subjected to quarantine. If anyone came from those countries, they would have to spend at least 14 days in quarantine before they could be released. And obviously, as the case was, our index case in Uganda, was detected on the 21st of March 2020, an arrival from the United Arab Emirates. At that time, the United Arab Emirates was categorized as low risk. This case was detected by our integrated disease surveillance and response systems implemented by our vigilant health workers, who raised the red flag when his temperature was above normal. He was evacuated to a hospital nearby, a nasal sample taken, and it was tested at one of our very good laboratories, which is also a reference laboratory for Africa. The test was positive, and so this was the beginning of the pandemic in Uganda. And as we are all aware, we are now where the pandemic has brought Uganda. So thank you very much, Amanda. This is our short story. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. And I think it really highlights a few key points that builds on the Brazil example, which is the, the importance of partnership, but also the importance of readiness and being prepared based on risk. Um, and I think the third point that comes out clearly there is your risk communication and community engagement. So maybe I'll turn to, to Abby uh, and the importance of the Red Cross volunteer network and how that community trust really helps early detection and early response. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, I'm really pleased to be joining everybody today and I'm really inspired by all of the other case studies in the report as well. I think these instances of nothing major happened um, typically receive little attention and really this is actually our goal. Um, so it's nice to have them celebrated. I will speak a little bit about the strengths of the uh, Kenya community-based surveillance system. And so it's really a straightforward, real-time system using SMS messages from trained community members um, into a system. Um, outbreaks and the ensuing epidemics begin in a community somewhere. So the CBS system enables those communities themselves to recognise potential epidemic diseases and establishes a channel for them to notify the responsible local authorities, such as the veterinary officials or health workers and thereby connect to the national surveillance system. So this means earlier detection and an opportunity for control at the outset, so as illustrated in the case study. Um, another important strength of the Kenya Red Cross program is that CBS doesn't stand alone. So it's coupled with training on epidemic diseases, transmission, prevention, key messages, and local actions for control. So it's nested within preparedness, not just a community-based surveillance system. I think they're two, two really key, um, key features of the system. But the importance of community engagement and effective risk communication underpin an effective um, CBS system, absolutely. Um, so the volunteers provide useful information and they are of the local community, but still the program takes time to build a trust and to build the relationships with those local health and veterinary staff to, to trigger that response. So the program is localised and forums for active community input and dialogue have been critical to success. So they're routinely built into the program. And you can see this in 
the case study of the anthrax control, that the engagement with farmers through traditional dialogue sessions directly led to their agreement to participate in the livestock program. Um, and this was, you know, this is consciously and deliberately in the program because this is an area of, of difficulty in the past. It can't be assumed that just because there's a response and an action that communities are willing um, and able to participate in that response. Um, so the response is two-sided. The response isn't just from the system. The response is, is from the community as well. Um, in CBS, it's really also important to connect communities with the formal staff. We're just a bridge. Um, and so health centre staff and veterinary officials um, need that connection in order for actions to be taken as well as actions to be received. Um, and in terms of some of the key lessons we take away from the experience, is that CBS has no impact without action and response. Um, so the periphery of the health system, the staff often bear very high workloads and in some settings work in relative isolation. And so responding to all of the community alerts and potential diseases um, and to reach those communities and investigate is not an easy task. So we really need to invest in and support the peripheral health and veterinary human resources and that peripheral surveillance system in order to respond well effectively. CBS system. You know, so there's two pillars there um, to establish effective CBS system um, and a program for action takes time. So we need investments and facilitation to put systems in place, build skills, build, build trust and to build relationships as part of a national community health strategy alongside primary health care really for preparedness. It's not something we're able to enact within a week or a month. Um, and I think finally, a key reflection of the case study is that everyday communities really can achieve amazing things um, and genuinely contribute to health security if they're empowered and enabled. So we really need strategies on how we can do this at the larger scale to be given attention. Um, this needs investment and I think it needs to be our clear goal, a common goal. Thanks so much, Abby. And I think the purpose of this report is really to make sure that we're learning the lessons from what worked. We've spent a lot of time uh, learning the lessons of what didn't work. I think we will spend a lot of time reviewing COVID. Um, but Ricardo, you've been involved in uh, the avian influenza pandemic, the H5N1 pandemic. What are the lessons that we learned from those big events that did translate across into better preparedness? And what are some of the outstanding gaps that we still need to work on? Yeah, thanks so much, Amanda. Um, and I'd like to thank you and the team at Resolve to Save Lives for the opportunity to speak today and be part of this great panel with Dr. Jane and, and Ms. Byrne. Uh, I also wanted to congratulate all the countries and communities featured in epidemics that didn't happen. Um, as, as Abby mentioned, these are really great examples of the work that has been done that not, not often is recognized because the events didn't happen. Uh, but it's, it's truly uh, remarkable and, and shows how we can make the world safer from infectious disease threats. And also a, a great reminder of the positive work and success stories as we continue to respond to COVID-19. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, we've been working for several years now to address multiple events. Um, and the United States government has been a key partner on the global health security agenda since 2014 to help countries strengthen their capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. And as you mentioned, uh, with USAID, our global health security program has been active over the last 15 years to address those uh, endemic emerging and re-emerging threats by partnering with countries on critical areas, including workforce development, viral surveillance and characterization, uh, outbreak response and com community preparedness and response. And in what has what has changed and what hasn't changed um, is is a difficult question because I think what we need to remember is that not every event is the same. And so uh, when we come upon these new emerging threats and, and diseases and, and outbreaks, we need to keep that in mind and that it's not going to be the last outbreak that we responded to. And we need to keep an open mind about that. But one thing that hasn't changed is the role of communities. Um, and I, I think there is a greater attention 
uh, due to recent outbreaks, uh, including Ebola in West Africa and in the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo. And of course, the, the excellent example captured by the Kenya Red Cross uh, with their work on community-based surveillance and their response to anthrax. Uh, but this hasn't always been the case. And I, I think communities have been taken for granted for many years. Uh, but USAID has worked to address that in working with community-based organizations like the Red Cross Movement to address these types of events like avian influenza, uh, the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, and other infectious disease threats. Uh, I, I think it's because we recognize and the, the world is recognizing that communities and local actors play this critical role for global health security. And if they're given those tools and understanding, like Abby mentioned, they can quickly identify these, these events and uh, alert national systems, as Dr. Jane had indicated and, uh, and highlighted in all of the great work that's being done there, to make that connection and bridge those, those two areas to prevent these epidemics. Um, but also to reiterate what Abby mentioned, working with communities is not something to be done only when an event occurs. It really is a long-term commitment that requires attention before, during, and after these events. Uh, it, it, that's really uh, the, the success, the key to success is, is this commitment and understanding that it, it is a process and working with communities builds trust. And, and so I think that's the other key item is that we're, we're seeing time and again, the factor of trust and working with trusted local actors and community leaders to respond to these health emergencies. Oftentimes there's no one better than those individuals within communities that you already know. And, and so that's why it's really important. And as we've seen with COVID-19, and it's something that we've been planning for and for many years, recognizing that when there are these types of events, many of these communities that will be impacted uh, even more severely will be impacted even greater because those external resources and assistance may be delayed or not available. And also to what Abby has mentioned, and I know as, you, as you've uh, iterated before, Amanda, many of these communities where we work are already communities that don't have uh, extensive resources in the first place. So that's why it's critical to, to work with them now and, mm -hmm. and think about it over the long term. Thanks so much, Ricardo. And I think COVID has really shown us the, the highlighted the gaps and in the inequity where we have the, the most vulnerable, both in terms of access to health system, but from other socioeconomic indicators, COVID has really exposed the gaps in our ability to um, to prevent these outbreaks. But I want to reflect back to Dr. Jane just in the last five minutes that we have and bring it full circle from government's need to prepare and respond and build the systems required to engaging with communities and making sure that we build those trust. How do we maintain the focus of the government, including the flow of finances? I think one of the examples in Uganda is the better you do, the more outbreaks you find, but the, the better prepared we are, the less um, uh, exposure they get, they, they don't happen. And so how, as the Minister of Health, do you remain focused on epidemic preparedness and engage with your other departments, including the Ministry of Finance? Well, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, first of all, many of you are aware that uh, in Uganda, every other year we have an, an ongoing outbreak that therefore keeps us on alert and it keeps us prepared. It's not easy though, but uh, I must state here very clearly that uh, it has helped us a lot to remain in touch with the communities at any one time and to continuously engage them, educate them and bring them on board. Mm -hmm. It has also helped us to remain in touch with the Ministry of Finance and to have a continuous engagement for them to know that to control an epidemic, you need resources available and you need it real quick. Of course, COVID-19 has been a great lesson to many countries around the world that controlling an epidemic or an outbreak is not cheap. And it requires you know, all arms of government to come on board and handle. 
and a great experience has been the COVID-19, where it is not only the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance involved, but we had ministries of transport involved. We had ministries of trade involved because most of our cases initially were coming in through the border points of entry because of trade and engagement through trade. We had uh, ministries of uh, information and ICT involved because we have to continuously pass on information to people. We had local governments involved because it's affecting the entire country. And I could go on and on and on. And this required that every ministry or department should put aside some finances to run the pandemic as is required based on the pillars that the Ministry of Health has set out and ensure that there is control at every stage. Now, what galvanized all these ministries together was having a national task force chaired by His Excellency, the President. And therefore, it was easy you know, to ask for resources and it is given to the various ministries and departments to control. And from the outset, I would like to say that our President has been a very committed and determined person when it comes to handling outbreaks. Because he comes out outright and announces there is an outbreak in the country and this is what you have to do. So it gets the communities listening, it gets the ministries listening, it gets the Ministry of Finance on a lot so that resources are provided as is required. But uh, COVID-19 has been a great lesson to the entire world. You know, it, it has shown us, you know, the strength of working together, but it has also shown us that an outbreak can occur anywhere and it spreads really fast. And it is not the rich nations that will control it or the poor nations that will suffer, but it depends on the skills of the people and how you engage the communities and the resources that you have set aside, you know, in preparedness for whatever happens. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Jane. And such a great summary, I think, of, of where we're really seeing the challenges, but the successes also in COVID uh, as we go forward and the importance of a senior leadership in the government and how that really drives the all the way down to the community level and having that clear communication, leadership and commitment uh, from presidential level into ministries of health and then all the way down into communities. Uh, and so I think some great takeaways there, both from the epidemics that didn't happen and the pandemic that is currently happening. So maybe just to round us off uh, on the panel, maybe one takeaway, I think one of the key messages from Resolve to Save Lives is there's not one thing that we can do to prevent the next pandemic. It's the combination of things that is going to make us stronger and better prepared. But if you could emphasize one lesson to take away from the epidemics that didn't happen or the lessons from COVID, uh, what would that be? And maybe I'll, I'll start with Ricardo uh, this time and, and move across the panel. Yeah, and I, I know we have short time. So my, my key lesson is what I had mentioned before is always treat the next one as something of the unknown. Uh, don't, be, uh, don't be surprised when your assumptions are, are, are challenged. And in order to do that, you need to address those critical elements, including uh, the key systems uh, to address those events as they come along. Thanks. Resilient systems, I think, is really important in making sure that we don't over uh, adapt to one uh, to one disease and, and leave ourselves short. So thanks so much, Ricardo, for all the work that you and USAID did contribute to this space. And Abby, what about from your perspective? Thanks, Amanda. Tough ask. One less time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be to build preparedness into everything we do and into our systems, into primary healthcare. It's not separate, it's within what we do. Um, and also to engage with communities as the norm, not in an imminent um, epidemic or pandemic. It should be the norm um, and then we'll be better ready. Excellent. Thank you so much for your support, Abby. And uh, Dr. Jane, to you for the final word, one takeaway if you could emphasise. Um, I would like to emphasize on preparedness, remaining on alert at all times, knowing that anything can happen anytime, anywhere, and continuous community engagement so that the communities also remain on alert. Thank you, Amanda.
I think uh, great words to take away with that the, the next pandemic is uh, any time going forward and we, we can't leave ourselves short. We need to learn the lessons, not just from this pandemic, but from the epidemics that didn't happen. And so with that, I'm gonna pass back to Dr. Tom Frieden for the final word. But thank you to, to the whole panel and I uh, appreciate both your efforts on the ground to prevent epidemics uh, and to uh, help us learn those lessons today on the panel. Epidemics don't have to happen. COVID-19 didn't have to be nearly this deadly. We can learn from the past to make the future safer and more secure. Let's make sure that we work together as a world so that we are never ever this underprepared for a health threat again. Thank you.